Hi, my name is Edwin Yick. I'm part of the SHARE program at the University of Michigan. The project I am doing this summer is called Catalytic Steam Gasification of Carbon Derived from Isooctane Decomposition over Nickel Supported on Syria Zirconia Catalyst. The principal investigators are Xiaoying Chen and Professor Johannes Schwank from the Transportation Energy Center at the University of Michigan. So some background. Uh, we are interested in looking at fuel cells which can act as auxiliary power units aboard vehicles. To power these fuel cells, hydrogen gas is required. The specific type of fuel cells we're looking at are solid oxide fuel cells, which use solid oxide as the electrolyte. The fuel cells exhibit high energy efficiency, they do not require a platinum catalyst, and they are resistant towards carbon monoxide poisoning. In order to operate these fuel cells, you need a source of hydrogen and most commonly explored is a process called hydro hydrocarbon reforming. Uh, the methane reforming is something that's been studied for the past three decades. It involves primarily the carbon-hydrogen bond breaking, which has a bond energy of 413 kilojoules per mole. Two popular processes that reforming undergoes are uh, partial oxidation and steam reforming. In the former, um, introducing a stream of oxygen allows the production of both carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas, also known as syngas. In steam reforming, you introduce uh, uh, water and you produce similar products. However, in the first uh, reaction, it's a exothermic reaction, whereas in the second, it's endothermic, which means it requires energy. A clever process which combines the two is called autothermal reforming, in which the heat generated from the first reaction can drive the second one. In our research, we're more concerned about the heavy hydrocarbon carbon reforming, since the fuel that is used by vehicles is primarily composed of isooctane. And since we're using fuel cells as a supplemental energy source, it would be nice to use the fuel that, that is already being used by the vehicle. However, in heavier hydrocarbon reforming, it also involves CC breaking, which is, which is more complicated than just the CH bond break. So in isooctane reforming, there's the use of liquid transportation fuels, and it cracks to lighter hydrocarbons, C1 through C4, through paralysis at high temperatures. Unfortunately, this leads to deposition of carbon, which deactivates the catalyst. However, the catalyst may be reactivated through successful removal of this carbon deposit. The mechanisms for carbon deposition have been studied, studied um, extensively for methane, but not so much for isooctane. So the first reaction you see here actually is undergone through intermediate mechanisms. Other further carbon deposition can occur through carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide production from the reforming. In order to remove the carbon, we introduce steam, a uh, stream of steam in order to gasify the carbon, producing hydrogen gas and carbon monoxide. However, if you see here, the products of the carbon deposition are the reagents for carbon steam gasification and vice versa. Therefore, there has to be a balance between the two. Hopefully, in order to prolong the life of the catalyst, the rate of gasification has to exceed that or equal that of uh, the rate of deposition. The choice of catalyst and support play a huge role in determining the activity and deactivation of the catalyst. It's dependent on the type of metal catalyst and support, the amount of metal loading, as well as the preparation of the support. In our research group, we're concerned with nickel metal catalyst since it, it is a good balance between activity and cost, costing much less than the platinum catalyst. It promotes carbon-hydrogen cl bond cleavage, which uh, promotes high activity, but unfortunately also leads to large carbon deposition. Uh, the purpose of a support is to promote the stability of the catalyst, maintain the high surface area for active components, and it also affects the dispersion of the metal catalyst. Unfortunately, at high temperatures, it tends to center or conglomerate, which loses the active surface area. Common choices for hydrogen carbon reforming supports include silica, magnesia, ceria, and gamma alumina. In our lab, we're concerned mostly with the combination of nickel and ceria zirconia dual oxide. Ceria is known to have oxygen storage capacity, and zirconia introduces lattice defects that can increase redox behavior. That's important because the carbon deposition that occurs on the surface of the catalyst 
may be oxidized through a redox reaction with ceria, thus removing the deposition. The carbon that is deposited on the catalyst comes primarily in two forms at the temperatures we're interested in operating. At lower temperatures, it forms the amorphous coating carbon, which coats the surface, preventing contact with the active site. At higher temperatures, it uh, forms the filamentous carbon, and there's a complex mechanism that actually removes the nickel metal from its support. The filamentous carbon forms long strands of carbon fibers and tubes. A proposed mechanism of acetylene reforming but done by Baker proposes two routes of deposition, one through the diffusion of the carbon through the nickel particle, and secondly through the transport of around the particle's peripheral surface. Although there have been some changes in the mechanism, the overall uh, mechanism through which the carbon is deposited has remained the same. In our research for isoacan reforming, we're looking towards determining what is the primary route through which deposition occurs. We know through pyrolysis, isoacan can Oxoactin can, um, can crack into lower carbons such as propylene, ethylene, and methane. We're interested in finding the route through which primary deposition is occurring. By exploring the decomposition of propylene in particular and the steam gasification of its deposit, we can hopefully find an optimal catalyst that uh, equates the two rates. The methods that we are using in the lab involve the thermogravimetric analysis coupled with the Fourier transform infrared spectro spectrometer. This way we can measure the changes in weight and the identity of the evolved gases. By loading a small amount of the catalyst and running various gas streams, the apparatus records changes in weight indicating rates and amounts of carbon deposition as well as gasification. Thank you.